Okay, hey everyone, back again. Now we're going to continue on the Marks train with episode six that I'm doing here. And this is going to cover chapter 32, Money Capital and Real Capital 3, in brackets conclusion, all the way to the end of part five, up till part six, titled The Transformation of Surplus Profit into Ground Rent. Now, before jumping into it, thank you for listening. Once again, um, I wish I could give you a gift for listening this far because it's really a commendable um, act. It helps me out a lot. And uh, I, I promise in the future, <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to do a 10 part series again, but this, if there was a way for me to not make this 10 parts, I would have done it, but it's, it's, it's a thousand pages. I, I, and it would be, it would be totally um, unfair to Marx to not do it the justice in, in the way that I imagine it needs. So yeah, anyways, if you want to follow me, you know how to do that. If you want to help me out, you could like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, you can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure into doing that. Uh, there are links for all things in the description. Go check that out if you want. And remember, if you're curious about what each episode I'm doing covers in the book, I've laid that out in the description as well. And yeah, so let's start here from chapter 32, Money Capital and Real Capital 3. So if you remember from the last episode, we were just discussing about how money capital is interest-bearing fictitious capital can have an effect on real production. It can have effect an effect in that it can produce crises. It can um, allow for overproduction because people can borrow money that they can then use to open up businesses that previously they couldn't have with the real money that they had uh, or with real machines that they had and so on. So new opportunities are afforded to people now with commercial capital. And this opened up a new possibility as well for a kind of social production, where now lots of people could contribute to production. It wasn't just localized to the owners of production. So this marked a kind of end of private property. And that puts us here, as a kind of quick recap, into chapter 32, where he says that he starts by saying, so a sudden reduction in the cost of production might mean more money for the capitalist that they can use to loan out. So if maybe the cost of the machines they're using has have gone down in price, they're suddenly earning a lot more profit. Now this will allow them to have more of a hoard of money that they can use to lend out, which will then can be used as money capital to earn them more money. And this is an example of industry creating money capital, allowing money to become a form of self valorization, allowing it to valorize itself. Or maybe there might be a delay in transactions that hold up the movement of capital, that restrict the movement of capital. And so the capitalist may look to loans to kind of um, to offset those costs that have come out. So if, you know, for example, they um, are selling shoes and those shoes need to be transported overseas and, you know, they're on a boat and they get stuck in customs and they can't be sold but they need to be sold in order for the capitalists to pay their workers. They might take out a loan to cover those costs until the shoes are finally sold, and then they'll have to pay back, you know, the, the amounts they already own, probably to the workers or whoever else, plus what they have to now pay in interest to the lender. So in this case, in such a case, industry is not motivating the creation of money capital. It's just drawing from that pool that already exists. So it's not like a capitalist just created more surplus value or extracted more surplus value from workers and then use that extra money that they've earned to then make that money make them more money in the terms of money capital. Here, they're only just taking from a hoard of money that already exists in a bank or by a rich person and using that to earn even more money for themselves or to cover costs that, they, uh, that they've incurred. So the presence of loan capital might be a sign of stagnation. Or it might be the sign of prosperity. You know, we can't really tell just by looking at it. So now he adds that some qualifications about loan capital that is paid for with interest. Number one, because interest is determined by average profit rate. And again, it's not like a smooth one-to-one -one relationship and not by the profit rate of specific enterprises. An enterprise might pay high interest while dropping in profits. While maybe, for example, other enterprises are paying really low interests. Now, another qualification might be that interest rates may go up when there's a demand for money capital, not a demand for industrial capital. 
which flies in the face of what those other political economists from the last episode were saying, that interest rate somehow has a connection to real capital or the value of real capital. Because some people might have an interest only in the money, in, in just money capital to earn the money, not, not real capital in production, which reveals the extent to which that it's all quite absurd for Marx that capital can assume the form of money or real, um, like, real physical machines or raw materials. The point here is that interest and loan capital are unpredictable, whereas industry is a more, I guess, a more clear way to understand uh, the baseline of wealth production. So because, it, you know, the production of wealth comes directly from industry, the, the, the creation of value comes from industry, not from loaning out money. Now, other uh, vulgar economists see money capital and, as an, and industrial capital as being the same thing. So they think that the supply and demand of money capital that determines interest is the same as supply and demand of real capital. And, you know, one of the other things about this, if you think about money just valorizing itself, is it completely negates the fact that labor is what is required to create value. What it does is it makes it seem as though, and it really affirms the idea that uh, value is created in exchange or that it is created in the circulation sphere, not that it is created by the exploitation of labor, which is just kind of a side point, something I probably should have mentioned the last episode, but in any case, here we are. So in other words, these people, these vulgar economists are saying that loan capital can be reflected in real capital like machines and raw materials. The only way this could be the case, though, would be if industri industrial capitalists were the only lenders and they lent their machines or buildings or whatever. So like if there weren't bankers who just lent out money, but there were capitalists who lent out like a machine, which is possible, you can you can do that, assuming it's like somewhat movable, you could lend out a machine. And in that case, you were lending out real capital, like in a in an industry in an industrial sense. So in such a situation, the borrower doesn't just want the stand-in for value, that is money, in itself. They don't just want money to make money. They acknowledge that value actually originates from labor, and so it would be required to draw upon real capital that is going to allow labor to go into motion because you need these machines for labor to work on because, you know, as, as an aside point, as an aside, you can't have an industry comprised purely of variable capital or pure as wages or purely as constant capital, as raw materials, as machines. Because if you only had machines or raw materials, you'd have no one to work them. And if you only had people, they wouldn't have any tools or raw materials to make things with. They would just be standing around with nothing to do. So they wouldn't be interested in the stand-in for value like money. They'd be interested in what that money could get them in terms of capital as means of production that will help them make more money. And this isn't to say that like this is a better way of organizing things, but it's to demonstrate the split between uh, lending capital as money and so-called real money capital and real capital, but also to demonstrate how they are, kind of go hand in hand in the capitalist economy. So this puts us here into chapter 33, the means of circulation under the credit system. So credit determines the amount of bills in circulation. These bills though, should always be tethered to the value of all commodities where superfluous bills find their way back to the issuer. And this is an idea in Adam Smith as well. And the, what Adam Smith said was that um, if there's too much gold or if there's too much money, per gold uh, to correspond to the amount of gold, then that excess money, like paper money floating around, will just naturally find its way back to the to the bank and the bank will dispose of it, but destroy it, you know, so that there can be a regulation in the amount of money in circulation that it doesn't stray too far from the gold standard. Now, of course, we've done, we've gotten rid of that entirely now, which uh, many people have theorized the implications of this, but if anyone wants to drop their own ideas, I'd love to hear about it. Um, but it obviously shows just how fairy dust-like, how fictitious 
this capital really is and what money really is. And there's a point in, I believe it's Capital Volume 1, when he speculates on why money can exist as a means of exchange, like paper money. And then he says, well, it's really quite absurd that we say that gold is valuable. You know, we've just agreed upon it. And we say that, okay, well, gold is scarce. But the thing is that we can also make money scarce, like assuming that you're able to um, print it in such a way that it can't be counterfeited. Like with Canadian, this is just the one I'm familiar with, Canadian currency today is supposedly very difficult to counterfeit. So the amount in circulation can be easily controlled, which puts the whole scarcity thing idea out the window. Anyway, so it's all just, <laughs> none of it makes sense. It's all fairy dust. Uh, and yeah. So, of course, um, these bills aren't just going to magically find their way back to the issuer if there's too much gold or their value doesn't correspond with the total value of commodities in circulation. But this isn't really the case. I mean, it's not really in the interest of banks and other lenders to just stop lending out money. <laughs> if they know they're, they can earn like um, more value on top of it, it would be absurd for them to say no. And this is like certainly one of the illusions that Adam Smith commits to just thinking that things will just magically regulate themselves. People will just magically have a total picture of all of the money in circulation and be able to say, oh no, there's too much of it. Uh, we don't need that. Or there's a point in Adam Smith when he's talking about meeting needs and he's like, we could never conceptualize a moment in which people would need more than like one pot. <laughs> it's like, you clearly don't understand what the capitalist economy is capable of doing in instilling needs in people and creating needs, not um, satisfying them. So banks and other lenders lend out way too much money. I mean, they just appropriate all of the labor of a nation, of the world, and use that money to earn themselves even more money without any scruples. I mean, they, they don't hesitate. Now that puts us here into chapter 34, titled The Currency Principle and the English Bank Legislation. And this chapter, this entire chapter is actually written by Engels. So that's just important to note here. And then the next chapter will be Marx once again. So here he's talking about the 1844, the, this bank legislation. The 1844 legislation is also called the, the Peel Banking Act or Bank Charter Act. Now this act sought to limit the lending opportunities to restrict note issuing power to the Bank of England. So you couldn't just be anybody lending out money. Now this act, the uh, English bank legislation, the 1844 legislative act, um, was motivated by the work of David Ricardo, whose text I've covered, the, his big text I've covered on this channel, if you want to go check that out, uh, who argued that values determined by labor power exerted in extraction and production of metals used as currency. Now, what that means, and we're going to get into this a lot more when we get into the section about rent, what David Ricardo says is that the value of money or the value of anything, value of labor, which determines the value of other things, is determined by the difficulty that that labor confronts in creating money in the form of gold. So how difficult is it, it is to actually work on mines to create, to bring money to market, which is going to affect the supply and demand of, um, of the amount of money in circulation, which is going to affect its value. So for Ricardo, the world market functions by allowing countries with abundance of metals to trade for commodities and vice versa. So if one country has a bunch of metals, like gold, they're going to trade that gold for goods to another country, and then that other country is going to have a bunch of gold that they could trade to someone else. Now additionally, for Ricardo, if there's an abundance of money, prices will come down and vice versa. At least that's the idea. But this, okay, th that seems counterintuitive. If there's a, an abundance of money, it would seem as though the prices of things would go up because there'd be inflation. So to clarify this, if a country receives more metals while money stays the same, the value of those existing bills will go up, bringing prices down. So here he's referring to money in like the gold that's received. So if there's more gold, then that means that the value of the existing money as, as, as uh, the representation of value their value is going to go up, which means prices of things is going to come down. You can get more for less. If money is added without an addition in metals, the money's value will go down, bringing prices up. 
and that would be a case of inflation. So these are the basic ideas of Ricardo, and like I said, we're going to get into this a lot more as we get into the part on rent and land. But banks took these ideas seriously and applied it to their issuing of banknotes to match the presence of metals. So there shouldn't be more banknotes in circulation than there should be gold. There should be connected. There should be the gold standard, essentially, should limit the amount of uh, money in circulation. So Marx says that these ideas only work by forgetting that value of commodities and money are largely independent of one another. And this still, this is Engels, but he's, he's drawing upon Marx here. And so, like, if there is a suddenly an abundance of money in circulation, some industries might not have the same experience as other industries. Like, there, the point is that there are just so many other factors that Ricardo just ignores because it's Ricardo. So one of the proposals of this Banking Act of 1844 was to readily destroy money in circulation if money was too much money was being imported. The idea here was to limit currency to stifle possible crises. And of course, it didn't work because uh, it only artificially elevated the value of existing currency or artificially brought it down to, its, um, to, to the right levels. And this obviously kept interest rates high by keeping money supply low. And then in 1857, there was a huge crash. So Engels is drawing upon this, this legislation and other, um, other vulgar economists who are saying like, yes, this is a great idea. We have to maintain the standard. They're pointing to Ricardo. They're indirectly pointing to Adam Smith, who says very similar things. And they're like, this is how we're going to stop a crisis. Because we can't have a crisis if everything is kept in a kind of natural state of equilibrium. But of course, they're doing the thing that they, they say can't be done and that is government intervention. What you're seeing here is the government stepping in and artificially affecting the, the presence of money within the economy. And that is going is not sustainable, and it's also going to create an artificial solution to a real problem. And so the problem will persist. And then in 1857, uh, it culminated into a huge crash. And that puts us here into chapter 35, and we're back with Marx now, titled Precious Metal, and the rate of exchange. So here are some initial points about precious metals, uh, that is gold, silver, bronze, uh, around that time, so around 1850. So there are eight here. He gives us eight kind of initial points about it to situate us here. So number one, precious metal supply was never so high as it was then, around 1850. Number two, precious metals have a value of their own, especially for countries that don't have mines themselves. These countries import and export these metals, signaling an independence of the value of precious metals from commodities. So they're being traded on their own, like they are themselves commodities. Number three, the rate of export or import of precious metals can be roughly determined by looking at quantities in central banks, how much of these precious metals are actually found within the banks. Number four, a drain of precious metals refers to a prolonged exportation until the reserve is depressed below its average level. Number five, the central bank has three purposes. Number one, to supply fund for international trade, uh, to supply a fund to expand or restrict domestic metal circulation, and to pay deposits, and to convert notes. They help exchange. You know, they help um, exchange currencies between different, different currencies and, and so on. Number six, Real crises tend to only happen after exchange rate has moved, once the import exceeds the export, for example. Number seven, after a crisis, precious metals will find their way back to countries in accordance with their role in the world market. And this is kind of the Ricardo idea, you know, if one nation has a bunch of metal, a bunch of gold, they're going to want to trade commodities in or buy commodities in order to get rid of that gold for the stuff that you can actually use to make more money. Oh, and I, I, there are actually nine. Sorry, I said there are eight. There are nine. So number eight, a drain of metal signals a shift in foreign trade and a potential crisis. And then number nine, balance of payments may be in favor of Asia and against Europe and America for whatever reason. Now, go back and listen to the last 40 seconds if you want those again. Um, it's not totally consequential, but he just lays out some of these properties of precious metals. So the importation of precious, Im the importation of precious metals happens primarily following a crash when, um, 
when interest rates are coming down, or when after a short period, when interest rates have begun to rise, but have not yet reached its average, their average level. So following a crisis kind of makes sense because there's going to want to be investment in, in that place. You know, you could probably buy commodities for pretty cheap. So other parts of the world are saying, look, um, the United States just went through a crash. Everything's super cheap over there. Uh, let's just, we can buy a bunch of stuff, throw a bunch of gold at them, get, get all the goodness. Uh, or after a short period when the interest rates have begun to rise, um, you know, it's still a good time for investment and people, other countries can invest their gold there. Now, a dream can occur on the flip side instead of a ton of new investment. A drain can occur following the realization of this average level and then there's, uh, during a period of overproduction, when a period of overproduction starts to ensue. And overproduction is referring to a point in which, of course, there aren't many people buying your goods, which signals that there isn't new gold coming into your country. Now, as for rate of exchange, which is in itself a kind of a, a head scratcher, it is determined by differing amounts of payments from some countries to others. So, for example, if England makes more payments to Germany than the reverse, the price of the German mark will be higher than the English sterling. And yeah, like, I have no idea how this is determined, like how uh, rates, of, rates of exchange are determined. Like, do they look at how many of a certain currency, how much of a certain currency does it take to buy, I don't know, the average priced house or loaf of bread in a country and compare that to another country or they take a bunch of goods and take the average and figure it out that way uh, but in any case he, he doesn't go into a great deal of detail about it here uh, just giving us this basic idea that if one country is sending more money to another that will affect the rate of exchange now the vulgar economists believe that industry will offset um, exchange rate because they believe that interest rates that is the value of money interest rate is the value of money, what money can go for, that determines the exchange rate, that that is directly affected by industry. So I think I said the term offset. I meant to say effect. Uh, so the vulgar economists believe that industry will affect the exchange rate because they believe that interest rates, which is the value of money, that determines exchange rate is directly affected by industry. However, we now know that this really isn't the case, necessarily. So in fact, because interest is a portion of profits, as profits go up, interest rate comes down in, in some cases. Uh, again, not always, but the point is to show that it is all just like these vulgar economists claim to know what's going on, to have a very good grasp of the situation at hand, when in fact it's, it's beyond their, their comprehension. So one central tenet at the time was that if, and this is Marx's words, if commodities are abundant, the interest money must be low. The interest of money must be low. While this might be true, like there might be situations in which that is the case, it isn't in times of crises when there are a ton of goods, but super high interest rates. Because a lot of people are looking, maybe, maybe they're looking for money at that time and interest rates are high because, you know, there's less money to actually lend out. Now, even though the, I think, I think it's important to note, even though the fairy dust characteristic or element of production and of the capitalist economy at this period, you know, the period of global market capitalism and credit, speculation, stock companies, while all of this are, you know, definitely point to the whole fairy dust element of capital, it's important to note that the fairy dust element was always there, where you'd have capital just valorizing itself, just magically being worth more than it is. And Marx, Marx says something funny here. He says that if the, if the monetary system is Catholic, then the credit system is Protestant. You know, in, in Marx's eyes, just two sides of the same coin, right? They are, they are different. It's important to acknowledge this difference. But it's also important to know that they are very much um, part of this same absurd contradictory laden process. And that puts us here into chapter 36 titled Pre-Capitalist Relations. So merchant, interestingly, merchant and interest capital are the oldest forms of capital. Interest-bearing capital, what he calls, funnily, uh, in his snarky, um, sly way, he just calls it user's capital at a bunch of points. 
in this uh, in this chapter, which is just referring to swindling, uh, to be a user is to steal people's money, essentially. So interest-bearing capital, he calls it user's capital, and merchant capital predate capitalism. And we already talked about this in another episode, but brings it up again. In any economy with money that can be invested, merchants and lenders may operate because you need people, or you need, uh, there's the idea that you need people to help you exchange this money to help it move around. And these people would either, um, I guess they would either lend to super rich landowners or small property owners. So this is referring to like a situation in which some people have a little bit of money, you know, they want to have that money earn them a little more than they might lend to some people who uh, can will actually pay them back. You know, there wasn't going to be speculation or risk taking. You weren't going to lend your money to a to a peasant who didn't have any means to actually do something with that money. Now, pre-capitalist money lending didn't necessarily encourage production because likely the case was that any amount that was earned on top of that would just have to be given right back to the user to the money lending, um, to the merchant or the, um, or the interest capitalist. And so there's no time or space to transform that any surplus value that is earned from actual workers back into more uh, production. And there was also just fewer opportunities to actually allocate that money in those ways. You know, there wasn't mass large-scale industry developed to that point that would allow people to easily go somewhere or you know talk to someone to get a newfangled machine that's going to help them earn more capital to valorize their capital and it you know mark says that it's really quite reprehensible at this time where merchant capital didn't even increase production which w- which would have increased the general well-being of people increased the amount of wealth floating around and this is one of the instances in which marx makes clear that In the way that he and Engels imagine moving beyond capitalism into a post-capitalist communist world, they don't want to go back. You know, they aren't looking back at these types of systems like this money lending to peasants and uh, the formation of first like early petit bourgeois people or feudalism, slavery. They're like, no, there's all of those suck too. The point is to say, to acknowledge that history is moving in such a way as to permit the establishment of an order, I call an order loosely, of a recognition of free individuals that is kind of anticipated with the capitalist economy that at least ostensibly acknowledges people as free agents in their own, um, in their own activities, to acknowledge the free reign of people over their own products, over, that, over their own labor. And so that labor won't be exploited any longer. And this is largely facilitated by the fact that there's so much of a historical, uh, so, so much historical effort has been put into making machines, developing techniques that make production so much more efficient so that more needs can be met more easily. So just put the idea out of your head now, if you happen to be of the ilk that Marx and Engels want to go back, they want to turn back the clock because they do not. So yeah, I I digress. So in such a system in which production wouldn't even be increased, all you'd see is just pure exploitation of workers. And so you'd have feudalism, you'd have slavery, um, people wouldn't earn anything for themselves. Now, it would be wrong, though, not to recognize the ways that usury, merchant capital, did help move beyond some traditional patriarchal forms of economic relations at the time. So it would allow people to develop some degree of economic autonomy away from dynasties, you know, dynastical, dynastical, away from dynasties, away from political power, away from rich families. It allowed people to be able to have some stake in the economy beyond to move away from these other historical means of entering the economy, of being an active agent economic agent in that world. So one of the ways that this happened was that these merchant capitalists, these usurers, made feudal lords indebted to them, and rich families made them indebted to these uh, merchants 
who didn't have the same desire to maintain like their family lineage and maintain their property in, in the same ways. And so what this did is it overturned the power traditionally held to these people while keeping the system of feudalism intact. So like it's not wasn't like a total change, but it did permit the the planting of certain seeds, kernels for something new to come. And as Marx write, users capital has capital's mode of exploitation without its mode of production. So even though it, you know there are some benefits to it, they are to some to some degree symbolic ones, they nevertheless users capital um is still going to be a system of exploitation. They don't look back upon it with starry-eyed exultation and celebrate it for what it was. But still, users' capital is important as a precondition for some elements of capitalism, like money is a general equivalent, like money is hoardable, like money as interest-yielding money capital, which are all elements of the capitalist mode of production, and allowing people to have uh, some degree of autonomy away from these uh, these dynasties away from slavery so that they could have some wealth and that they could be uh, put to work and have some of that work be transformed into surplus value for the capitalist. Now, what is different with credit under capitalism is that it is somewhat in the lender's interest for the borrower to make money because if they don't, then the, the lender isn't going to make money because they need the person they lent to to actually make money to pay them back. So the borrowed money will be assumed to transform into capital, whereas with pre-capitalist usury, the goal was just to turn people into, like, enslaved people through debt, which, don't get me wrong, it still happens now. Like, it's still very much the goal of lenders to drive people into debt. But, you know, the, the way that it appeared to itself, it, the way capitalism appears to itself is as a more uh, benevolent, beneficial system for the people at large that won't, like, just leave them in the lurch, that wants them, at least this is the story it tells itself and tells the people who live in it, it wants them to be successful. Everyone can be a millionaire, it says, when, of course, that is not true at all. So, of course, between both systems, like these pre-capitalist ones and capitalist ones, there, there are so many similarities but also so many differences, as I think I've made clear already. But the real difference is not between usurer and credit lender. It is the difference in the modes of production that they exist in. Because they're really the same person. But because capitalism was not developed at that time with merchant capital in pre-capitalist relations, they just took on a new form under capitalism, or they not really even a new form. They'd still do the exact same thing. But the mode of production being a capitalist one permits, to some extent, the uh, organization of certain social relations in such a way as to make it so that people are ostensibly free to go to work, and they apparently willingly give up their extra labor for the capitalist out of their own goodwill. So like in the case with stocks... Banking credit marks a point of capitalist production where ownership is largely done away with, at least by the owners of the means of production. So we can't be duped by this, though. We can't say, oh, well, this is so much better. Like, things are, things are great now. Where, like, with, with stocks, anyone can participate. You know, I can, I can have a part of Apple. Like, if I just worked for a little bit, I can be a part of that. I can profit share with Apple. So to, you know, at least so the story goes, it is still capitalism, no matter how many people are engaging with it in this way, so long as there is credit and, and there are other conditions as well. There's alienated labor, you know, the exploitation of labor for the accumulation of capital itself, not for the satisfaction of needs and so on. So banking credit will, in Marx's words, serve as a powerful lever in the course of transition from the capitalist mode of production to the mode of production of associated labor, which is one of those instances in which he gives us a, an image, an illustration of what post-capitalism would look like. He says associated labor. And he says this because insofar as the stock market presents the opportunity, a glimmer of a social form of production or of participation within production, within industry, it does away with the simple uh, 
the simple dynamic of private ownership. You know, one person, one family owns owns a business, owns land. Now everyone can participate in it pretty easily, like logistically easily, not like actually getting the funds to, but like they can, right now they can go on their phone and buy stocks, like easily like that, so if they have a phone, of course. So it's important to note and to read that again, he says that uh, banking credit will serve as a powerful lever in the course of the transition from the capitalist mode of production to the mode of production of associated labor. However, only as one element in connection with other larger scale organic revolutions in the mode of production itself. So it's not like th this itself is not a sign of associated labor. This is, has to come alongside all of these other changes, these large scale organic revolutions in the mode of production itself. And yeah, that'll put us here into part six, which is a natural place for me to end. And uh, that'll be titled The Transformation of Surplus Profit into Ground Rent, when we're really going to get into the weeds of David Ricardo and all the issues with his idea about rent and the worst land setting the price, the prices for goods and not paying any rent and so on. So yeah, if there's anything I got wrong or anything I omitted, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, if you like what I did, you could like, share, subscribe. You can leave a review. I get to read all the reviews. I can't respond to all of them. You can leave five stars on your uh, if your podcast platform lets you. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you all next time. Take care.